Thank you for listening to Truth and Reason as we continue our discussion of Ephesians. We are in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll continue our reading from Ephesians 2 and verse 11 in just a moment. I'm Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ, and we invite you to worship with us every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. And uh, we are located at 689 North Main Street in Russellville, Kentucky. If you'd like to know a little bit more about the congregation, just search for our website. Uh, You can go to Google or any search engine and type in Northside Church of Christ, Russellville, Kentucky. And you'll find our website with links to our Facebook page and uh, this YouTube channel and other resources that you can use to know a little bit more about us and use in your study of God's Word. If we can answer any questions for you, uh, please message us through any of those means as well as our um, email address, uh, northsidechurchofchrist at hotmail.com. So we hope to hear from you, and if you have questions about this program or any others, or would like to hear just um, another Bible subject uh, spoken of, we'd be happy to put together a program for you. But uh, really, we'd like to sit down and study God's Word with you. And if you're in the area, uh, please come and meet us and get to know us and uh, see what we're striving to do as the Lord's Church in this community. If you're not in our area, um, let me know. Be happy to uh, find and arrange a, a meetup for you with some brethren in the area that you might be. We know we know churches and brethren all over uh, the world, and uh, just uh, send a note our way, and uh, we'll do our best to find you a um, uh, an opportunity to study with somebody uh, one-on-one. But let's go ahead and get right into our study this evening as we uh, come to, I think it's a simple lesson. It's Ephesians 2, verse 11 and following, talking about um, the opportunities that have been given to uh, the Gentiles, which pretty much, for the sake of dividing people into two different groups, according to the New Testament era, you, you had the Jews and you had the Gentiles. The Gentiles made up pretty much the rest of the world, no matter what country they were from or um or even religious belief that they may have had. Uh, The Gentiles were made up of various um, peoples from all over and uh, had a great influence of that time, obviously, from the Roman Empire, um, a great Italian influence. As we see from Acts chapter 10, uh, the first Gentile uh, man and his family uh, who were obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, is the first documented or recorded opportunity uh, that shows the uh, fulfillment of God's promises made from the very beginning, that through his plan of salvation, through Jesus Christ, his seed, all nations would be blessed. And uh, we have, at least at this time period of Ephesians, have come to that point and are past that point, but yet Paul is often noted as being a primary uh, person of which delivered the gospel message to the Gentile people. Uh, obviously, we know that wasn't the only group that he had taught. Uh, in fact, you can go back to Acts chapter 9 when uh, Saul is introduced to us and uh, he's on the road to Damascus. And of course, the Lord tells him to go on into Damascus and there he'll be told what he must do. Uh, he struck blind for three days. Ananias is sent to him and the Lord said to Ananias, this is actually the Lord convincing Ananias that he needs to go talk to this man uh, who is a persecutor of the church. And Ananias is like, uh, he's, you know, he, he wants us dead. He wants us in prison. Uh, but obviously the Lord knows all men and knows their hearts. But verse 15 says, the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear the name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my, for my name's sake. And certainly that's what uh, Paul the Apostle did. And uh, he writes about these things extensively. He talks a lot about the persecutions he endured uh, to the Corinthians uh, in his letter to them. But uh, this isn't to pity him. This is to show that uh, God's grace with, was with him throughout the entire thing. That even the, as he says uh, in our previous lessons, uh, you know, he had a thorn in the flesh, whatever that may have been, um, that uh, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so uh, he was willing to do the work of the Lord, uh, and he saw a greater 
existence in serving Jesus Christ our Lord, as we need to see a greater purpose, a greater teaching, a greater life that we could have. And so the next portion of our reading from Ephesians 2 uh, deals with that, of the state of the Gentiles before uh, they were given that opportunity to become Christians. And now he's telling primarily a Gentile audience here in, in Ephesus that, um, you know, you've been given this hope as well. And uh, don't, don't forget from where you've come. Don't forget uh, what you're considered to be in uh, the sight of God. And uh, one of the terms used here, I'm using the New King James Version, and it's probably primarily a term used in uh, most translations, and that is aliens. <laughs> so that's why I've titled this program tonight, Aliens. You may have thought it was a catchy title. It certainly grabs uh, people's attention, and we'll see that in our reading when we get to verse 12. So let's go ahead and begin our reading as we look at just basically verses 11 through 13, and I'll try to give a, a shorter lesson tonight on um, the state of the Gentiles, where they were, and what they have become. Verse 11, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Uh, some of these are terms that we're going to see all through Scripture as we do some cross-referencing in just a moment. But let's go up to verse 11 when he says, remember. And I always like that approach that the apostles sometimes take. Um, you know, Peter would use it in his letters when he says, I want to remind you of the things pretty much that you already know. But I want to assure you of the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. So you remember where you came from. Remember the state that you were in before. Without hope? Without, without Christ? I mean, what a desperate place to be. And we know that during this time, there was, a, there was still some division between uh, many even you know, Christian Jews who had come to the Lord who just weren't happy with... Uh, you know, the, the Gentiles, and they're not meeting those requirements, you might say, of the old law. Uh, it, it was an issue in the first century, not so much today, but yeah, it was an issue in the first century that you see uh, taught about heavily of the fact that they wanted, the, the Jews of that day, wanted the Gentiles to be circumcised and adopt certain, uh, whether it was ceremonial laws or basic laws of the old law, and try to mix the two together. Whereas what they weren't understanding is that those things were no longer necessary uh, in order to be a, a child of God. And you can go back and do you know the research on, on circumcision. I mean, um, it's important to note that under the old law, you know, Old Testament days, that uh, they were required to be circumcised, the males of, of the Jewish nation. And that was their sign of, of, of who they were. It was an act of obedience to God. But he says... You were once Gentiles in the flesh, okay? That's a way of saying that you were separate and apart from, from God, being in a uh, solely a fleshly state. Because what are we in today? We are in a spiritual state with God, in a spiritual kingdom. We are a spiritual people. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek or Gentile, whatever it might be. What matters is that you're a Christian serving God. And he says, you were once called uncircumcision, now, for the Jew of that age uh, and before, you know, that was like, uh, you know, kind of a, I guess, a, a very divisive term in the fact that if you weren't of the circumcision, in other words, you weren't, uh, you know, of the Jews, then you were unclean. You weren't right in the sight of God. You were a heathen, a pagan, a sinner, probably an idol worshiper and everything else uh, that you could throw at them. And to be an uncircumcised and to be called such uh, would have been a great offense uh, to any people. And uh, so he says, you were called in circumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hand. So he establishes that this whole idea of circumcision, though it was spiritual in regard to its intent, it was a very physical act uh, that was actually, you know, kind of came became derogatory uh, in, in a way to describe who the Gentiles were. And, uh, and their separation 
uh, from their relationship with God. So the Jews didn't have any problem throwing that around. Um, and this was a problem that even when the first, uh, well, I mentioned Cornelius earlier in our comments, uh, when Peter went to his house and he went back to Jerusalem uh, to defend going to a Gentile's house and eating with uncircumcised people. Um, but of course, it was about them becoming Christians and eventually they learned to glorify God uh, by the fact that Cornelius and his household were baptized into Jesus Christ. You can read about that in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. But then he says, so during that time, yes, you were without Christ. Uh, look at verse 12 again, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. What a lonely and desolate place to be uh, when you are without God. And this is important for us to note today that no matter who you are, uh, if you are without God, uh, you are in this same position that, at, that, that, that you are alienated from him. And um, I've talked to many people who want to claim, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross, so, you know, my sins are forgiven. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. You can't take a few Bible verses out of context and realize that because he died, as John chapter 3, 16 teaches us that God sent his beloved son to die because he loved the world, to, to give his son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Of course, John 3, 16 doesn't tell us the entire plan of salvation. It tells us the point of it. It tells us what we are striving to obtain through what God has done for us uh, in his love. But I've got 1,500 pages of a Bible here to explain what all that means. And that's why we have to go through all these things and put them all together, just like last week in our lesson about Ephesians 2, you know, verses 8 through 10, showing us how grace works and how we are, uh, you know, workers for Jesus Christ. People want to separate those. They want to put everything in little boxes and try to distinguish one point over another. We do not teach baptism over grace. We do not teach uh, anything. We do not teach you know, grace or belief over the acts of, of baptism and obedience to God. They are all equal in the sight of God. And so many things that we do lead to our salvation. But anyway, back to the point that we're making here about being without Jesus Christ. You don't get to have the advantage that, that uh, the Jews had. We know that salvation is of the Jews. This is what Jesus taught the woman at the well in Samaria, uh, that uh, you know salvation comes through the Jews. Christ came through the Jews. When you read through the Old Testament, everything points to Jesus Christ for the salvation of mankind. He made those promises to Eve. He made the promises primarily to Abraham. I'm sure you're familiar with that, uh, that all nations would be blessed through his seed, and that seed being, of course, Jesus Christ. And that, um, you know, we would be a spiritual kingdom as Jesus would sit on the throne of a perpetual throne, the throne of David. And this is shown to us throughout the Old Testament, leading us to a spiritual nation. It's not about land anymore. It's not about a physical nation anymore. Uh, we all need to live in nations that serve God, but we are not nations of God. The nation of God is his church. And that's what we established in Ephesians chapter 1. Um and looking at being in Jesus Christ. Well, getting back to the verse here, that without Christ is just being aliens. It's it's foreign to him. Now, you could say, well, I mean, I was born here, didn't ask to live. God created me. Yes, you know, we, our souls belong to God. But uh, to establish a relationship with him isn't just because you were born into it. And that may have been the standard under the, under the old law. Uh, if you were a descendant of Abraham, uh, that's what a lot of people you know, hung their salvation on. Uh, but the fact was, is that in the New Testament, they're being taught, no, just because you came from Abraham doesn't automatically seal your salvation and, uh, uh, in place. So we get that kind of mentality today to think, well, I go to church, I've been baptized, I've done this, I've done that. We like to go through a checklist, which is good to do all those things. But don't just count on your salvation because of one or two things that you've done is a continual living for the Lord. It's a continual uh, living as a, as a living sacrifice. This is what Paul tells the Roman brethren in Romans chapter 12, to be a living sacrifice. And that's very important here, because when you want to uh, 
be one with God, you have to be what, what verse 12 says here. You've got to be part of the covenant relationship with him. And the old covenant did its thing, primarily for the Jews. Uh, but under the new law, we have a new covenant between us and God. And that's the point, that all men can be saved through a new covenant. This is why we call the New Testament the New Testament. I mean, the testament and covenant are two different things here. But the, the covenant is a law. And we must do our part to keep uh, the covenant of God. God's done his part, and we need to do ours as well. Because without that, there's no hope. Without, there, without that, we are without God in the world. But of course, it's all summed up in verse 13 to show that all these things are accomplished through Christ Jesus and his blood. Let's read that again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This again is just reminding the Gentiles that the gospel is for all. Uh, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you now have an opportunity for eternal salvation. And this was a promise given. Uh, and you go back to Acts chapter 2, and you look at the beginnings of the church uh, there on the day of Pentecost. And though the audience was primarily uh, a Jewish audience there, uh, it would be some time before uh, they could be well grounded in the faith, and then the gospel would be given to the Gentiles, as we see in Acts chapter 10. But when we look at the promise of salvation given to them, uh, go back to Acts 2, verse 21. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then, of course, a lot of things are taught about the death of Jesus Christ and how uh, the house of Israel uh, had crucified Jesus and 3,000 were cut to the heart. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, his revelation, his word, the knowledge of God that they needed to live by and to put into their hearts, he says in verse 39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And of course, God has called all men. Will we answer that call? And that's what Paul is basically talking about here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. That once again, through Jesus Christ, you once who were far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. And the Jew is saved the same way. Not under the elements of the old law, not as a circumcised people, but as the New Testament alludes to, we are to be circumcised to the heart. It's a, it's a figurative term uh, that we use today. And so, so doing means, well, I guess we could symbolically say there's a lot of cutting away of, of you know, the sin, uh, the sin of the flesh and so on. And we need to change our lives and, and do God's will. Uh, but we are a separated people, set apart to do the will of God. And again, you find that in Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius and his household were baptized, uh, God having given that sign to the Jews that he was now accepting the Gentiles as his children. But they must obey uh, to meet the, the requirements. That's the thing about, you know, the, the positive things that we can see about the necessity of, of circumcision and so on is that, yes, there were requirements. But those requirements of the old law, much like we read last week, in uh, looking at uh, the, you know, the works that did not save, for instance, in verse 9, uh, that you're saved by grace through faith, but verse 9 says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I'd mentioned that some of those works could have very well been you know, works of the old law as well. And considering the context continues from verses 11 through 13, I think this is just a kind of a long way of him saying, you know, the works of circumcision are not going to save you. But to be circumcised of the heart and to be brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ means that you need to obey Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized into Christ where the blood of Christ does its work. And so that's what cleanses us of our sin. It's not, it's not anything magic in the water. The water is the element or the tool in which we carry out uh, the, the act of our obedience to God through baptism. But it is the blood of Christ that cleanses and washes away our sins. And so having been cleansed and washed of our sins, we have become a circumcised people, circumcised of the heart. And so 
We need to be a people who are brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ because without Christ, you cannot be saved. There's still a lot of religions in the world today that want to say that you can be saved without Christ, that uh, they want to say they believe in God. Well, Jesus said many times, you know, you say you believe in God, but don't believe in me. There's an inconsistency there. You cannot say that you love God and do not love the Son. You can't say that you love God and not follow the Savior. It is Jesus who sits on the throne of the kingdom to one day give that throne back to the Father when all things are completed and done here upon this earth and we return to a home in heaven with him for all eternity. It's going to be a wonderful day and we need to be prepared for it. I want to remind us again because I've mentioned Romans before in this study as we come to the close of our lesson today in Romans chapter 10 verses 1 and following. Remember that Paul the Apostle isn't just making a, uh, he's not just distinguishing the Jews from the Gentiles, saying that, you know, you have no hope. Without Christ, you have no hope. That's the message that's here today. At one time, you had no hope because you were not a circumcised people. But now Christ is taking care of all that. And one of the problems that you run into in, in the letter of Romans uh, in this time period is the fact that the you know so many of the Jews were still hanging on to the elements of the old law and requiring circumcision among the Gentiles. And the Gentiles had to be reminded, you read through the book of Acts and get down to chapter 15, uh, they had to write a letter to Gentile brethren saying, look, don't be troubled by these troublemakers who want to tell you that you need to do this, you need to do that. You just simply follow Jesus Christ. And there were some other things that they required of them. But let's, let's look at Romans 10, 1 and following for just a moment. Um, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so he goes on there to make the distinction between Moses' law and and, of course, the law that we have in Jesus Christ. And it goes on down to say in verse 12, For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And that's what's been taught from the beginning, that all who call upon him. What does it mean to call upon the Lord? Well, to do his will. It's not just saying, Oh, Jesus, I give my heart to you. <laughs> that's not a biblical verse. It's a, it's a matter of obedience to him. It's answering the call. But anyway, going back to what we pointed out just a moment ago is that his desire is that Israel may be saved. But he's saying they're going to be saved the same way as the Gentile. They're going to be saved the same way as the Italian Roman. They're going to be the saved the same way as the as the brother in Ephesus here. And a lot of these people uh, follow Greek gods, if you remember. You know, the goddess, uh, uh, oh, was it Athena? Uh, pa pardon me if I, don't, if I got that one wrong. Uh, I don't keep up with my Greek gods, but <laughs> uh, you can find the accounts of that in the, the book of Acts where Paul, you know, was once again, you know, taken in by the mob and imprisoned and given a real hard time because he spoke against their, their false uh, idols. But getting back to Ephesians chapter 2, there were brethren that came out of those studies. Uh, there were churches that were established in each of these areas that uh, believed many falsehoods. And he's saying, look, you've been saved in Christ. And that's the assurance that you can have, and that's the assurance that you and I can have today as well. So follow Jesus Christ, our King. Uh, do His will, love Him, and as Jesus said it best, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not about being circumcised. It's not about keeping matters of the old law. It's not about, as we studied last week, doing your own works. It's about doing the works of the Lord which he prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. That's where your salvation lies. That's what you can count on, because you don't want to be without God, and you don't want to be without hope. You don't want to be an alien. So thank you for listening tonight. We hope that you have a good week ahead, and we'll see you next time on Truth and Reason.